22nd, 2020, Born the Battle, brought to you by the Department of Veterans Affairs, the podcast that focuses on inspiring veteran stories and puts a highlight on important resources, offices, and benefits for our veterans. I am your host, Marine Corps veteran Tanner Iskra. Hope everyone had a great week outside of podcast land. I saw on a blog on blogs.va.gov that registration is open today for the 34th Golden Age Games. Anybody, any veteran 55 and over that is receiving VA health care can participate up in Madison, Wisconsin. The games are June 22nd through the 27th, but registration is open today at www.veteransgoldenagegames.va.gov. Veterans Golden Age Games is all one word. I saw that and it reminded me of some of the amazing feats that some veterans accomplished at last year's games that we featured on our social media. So... If you're interested, go register. Looks like a great time. couple more ratings this week. No reviews. Uh, I need to find another piece of content to hold ransom, I think. I think that might be the next step. Remember, the more ratings and reviews not only lets me know how we're doing as far as bringing you what you want as far as content, the ratings, reviews, and subs give a better chance to climb in the iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, etc. All those ratings, all those algorithms which in turn allows us to reach more veterans out in podcast land and gives them a chance to listen in and hear not only the great stories, but the benefits breakdown episodes and the information provided in the news releases. Also, I ask if you are a listener, feel free to share this in any kind of veterans group on social media that you may have, you know, group chats, Facebook groups, any group that you think of where veterans can uh, find this information useful. Speaking of news releases, We don't have any new ones this week. However, as they are released, I'll make sure to get them to you. All right. So this week we have an Army veteran, Major General Retired, Jim Jackson. He is the director of the United States Vietnam War Commemoration. It's a national effort directed by Congress, executed by the Department of Defense, to thank those that never got a proper welcome home, our Vietnam veterans. And he's going to talk about how they go about doing that and how you can take part. Now, while he was in the Army, Major General Jackson served in some iconic units, the 82nd Airborne, 2nd Ranger Battalion, and he also commanded troops in the 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry, and the 3rd and 75th Ranger Regiments. As a civilian, he also took part in Iraq's Coalition Provisional Authority, which was a unique time in Iraq's history. Gotta say, it was a fascinating conversation, and I can't wait to bring it to you. So, without further ado... I bring to you Army veteran, Major General Jim Jackson, retired. Enjoy. Sir, I really appreciate you doing this. Welcome to Born the Battle. As you can tell, it's a very Spartan operation we have here with, with uh, you know, welcome to our mobile studio. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Major General Jackson, we're going to start this this interview like we ask everybody here on Born the Battle. Why did you join the military in the first place? What was that decision for you? Well, it was not so much of a decision as it just something kind of happened. I was born, I lived in a military family. My father's a 33-year veteran, World War II in Korea. He never pushed it, but I was exposed to it. When I went to college, got into the ROTC program, enjoyed the courses, so I stayed with it. And then all of a sudden I found out I had to make a decision. I decided to give the military a try. And the next thing I realized it was 32 years. (laughs) It it just went by. Just a flash in the pan. I was very fortunate. I got to do the things I wanted to do in the military and stayed in the light business, jumping out of a lot of perfectly good airplanes. And (laughs) it was interesting, exciting. I enjoyed some of it, but it was exciting. And it kept the interest up. So it was good thing to do. What do you what do you miss the most? I miss the people. I mean, yeah. you talk to most folks and they'll tell you the same thing. The, the stuff we did, you could live with some, throw some of it away, you know, some of the BS you get rid of, but the people were always what bring you back, you know. They just bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. They just the the idea of nothing that we can't do you you tell us what you want done and we'll make it happen and it's just it's an infectious thing to be around and uh, so most veterans will tell you the same thing absolutely sir you mentioned ROTC and I and I noticed in your bio you were an ROTC graduate at Kent State 
Now, were you a freshman or a senior in 1971? Did you graduate in 71? Uh, I was actually 70, year 70, I was a junior. That was the year we had the trouble at school. Yeah, you were there when right. during the shootings at Kent State. What was that right. like being an ROTC at that university? Well, in all honesty, there was not much of a big change one way or the other. I mean, we went about our business. People left us alone. I actually worked in a bar right across the street from the university, and everyone knew I was in ROTC, and they just didn't seem to care. I never got treated poorly, and I'd wear the uniform periodically. Were you? I mean, did you have to wear a uniform at school sometimes? Yes, yes. And yeah. you'd have to, because of the class schedules, there would be classes you'd go to in uniform, and it, it wasn't a big problem. The university was kind of sleepy hollow from that perspective. Now, there were some, some protests and some natural things that you have on a college campus, but a little surprising what happened there, and it caught a lot of people by surprise. But, I mean, it was just because Kent is a very small school, a small, yeah. small town. The Mac, school Mac is not a big Big conference well, in general. The school itself, total population at that time was over 30,000. So it was a big school, Roger. but small town. Mm. I mean, this is small town USA, maybe one stoplight, two stoplights in a town, bunch of four way stop signs kind yes, of sir. thing. And so it, it really wasn't an expected kind of thing to happen. But, you know, we lived through it. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. So you graduated and went on to have a very long, very distinguished career. Who was either your greatest mentor or your best friend? Well, it's unusual to have one that did both, but in some cases that happens. I got it. I was privileged to work for some very, very good people who were very successful, more successful than I was in the military. And they took the time to coach and advise. And so, and plus, when I came in, everybody I worked with. Everybody who worked for me at the you know E6 levels, the sergeant, uh, staff sergeant level or higher, they were all Vietnam veterans, and so you, you ran into people that you you understood these guys have done something that you haven't done yet, and therefore you paid attention to them. Yes, sir. And so what I'm fond of telling people is, look, if if anything good came out of my years, it, you can probably attach it to a Vietnam veteran someplace somehow. But I had I had a chance to work with some very good people, and they've been close friends even till today. Uh, unfortunately, now we're getting at that age where we're starting to lose a bunch of these people. Yes, sir. So who would you, if you were to name one? Well, if I had to pick one, I just saw him here this last week, uh, General Buck Kernan. We were in and out of the Ranger Regiment together and in the 82nd together at different organizations, but we were we saw each other periodically. He is. He was influential in a variety of things that I did, and, and helped me get into certain jobs. And because of that, that's what allows you in the military to proceed. If you take on the difficult jobs, and if you're successful, you'll get promoted. If you don't take on the difficult jobs, you won't. Yes, sir. But so he was involved with that, and I just saw him this last week, and he's not doing real well, but. He's hanging in there, and we wish him well and hope he recovers and from some surgery he's done and he gets back to doing things that he wants to do. Absolutely, sir. If, if, is it, if Buck Hernan taught you one thing, what, 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 what would that one thing have been? Well, I think it's it's something we've, we've seen by a variety of people who serve in the military, and that is remember who you work with and remember them when they might need you and always be there. There's a there's a great you know there's a great uh, little note that General Sherman sent to General Grant at some point in time in the Civil War where he basically said I always knew you would be there if I needed you and you would come to my aid and I've kept that on my mantle at home and I look at it every once in a while and that's kind of the thing that in the military if you're working for the right people you always know they're going to be there they're not in your way, but they'll always be there if you really need them and they'll show up. And that's what I took away. Absolutely. 100%, sir. Totally agree. You said 32 years, sir. How did retirement come to Major General James Jackson? It just, you know, it was the timing was right. You know, you, you 
just things fall into place and you just figure, well, it's time to do, do something else. And there are certain things that happen that cause you to go, geez, I guess it's time to move. And uh, we did that. We were very fortunate in this part of town. And my kids looked at me and said, we'll do whatever you want, but we don't want to go to another school. And mm. that kind of that kind of plays into it some too. Uh, family, it's amazing how much uh, family changes that that yeah. those career dynamics. Sir, what year was this? Uh, I retired in two thousand three, Roger, and that was out of here out of DC. Yes, it was. What was transition like in 03? Well, I mean, as a two star, I got helped a lot. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I didn't I didn't have that much of a problem. And again, because I was expecting, uh, wasn't quite the recession yet either. No, yeah. And I got out and within. Uh, couple of weeks I was working and uh, doing something else and I got a chance to get in the private sector a little bit and did some things for them but it was an interesting time talk to me about that you you worked for the you worked within the coalition provincial authority which you know I think is a very unique time in Iraq's history not many people know about it talk about it discuss it what role did you play in that well, that came about, I was working for a private sector company and a friend of mine, we were actually talking at a high school football game. <laughs> Interesting. And he said, you want to go to Iraq with me? And I looked at him and said, you got to be out of your mind. And I said, well, wait a minute before I, okay, now let's back up. What are you talking about? And he laid it out for me. I said, well, that sounds interesting. Well, let me f check and see. And so I got a hold of my company that I was working with and asked him, would you give me three months sabbatical here? And they said, yeah, we'll let you go for three months. Wow. And so th the intent was uh, to go over and work with the CPA. They were going to restructure and reorganize, and they wanted to put a operation slash planning organization underneath the, the CPA. Then General Keith Kellogg was the guy asking me, and I said, sure, I'll come with you. So we went over, we took a couple uh, uniform guys, active duty people, and we took some other retirees, and we went over there for three months and worked with uh, Mr. Bremer and got a chance to travel around the country and meet some old friends who I knew, you know, and, and we talked to them and, and tried to Help them out a little bit. So operational planning in a sense of, of, of military strategy? Not military, more so the execution of, of work in conjunction with the military. Because at that time, the CPA was there. The military was rolled in. There was probably a little bit of misunderstanding of exactly who was in charge, be it the military or the State Department. Yeah. But real, real quick background on the CPA. What, for those that don't know what the CPA was. The Coalition Provision Authority that was put, put in to transition from military to back into civilian yes, sir. control and working with the Iraqis. And so it was very interesting to work with Mr. Bremer, go to meetings and sit there and listen to what they were doing and, and have to answer questions if someone asked, well, what do you think we should do? You know, okay, well, we'll figure this out. Roger. And so we were working with the police and the military and, of course, the U.S. military, the Iraqi military, and um, all the um, law enforcement agencies that were trying to be rebuilt within the Iraqi structure. I, I just think that's a, an extremely unique time in Iraq's history, yeah. extremely unique time in, in, in the DOD's history, and not enough has been ever talked about that. Yeah, it was an interesting time, and I'm sure history will peel that thing apart and take a look at it. And I'm sure there's some things that we could have done better, and there's lots of things that we did well, and it should be talked about. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. So after that, sir, your bio says that you retired after eight years in the public sector. That's a that's a very unique way of putting that. <laughs> eight eight years. How did you come to that conclusion? And tell me how you found yourself with the the United States American Vietnam War commemoration which we're at here today, and ultimately, how, how did you become its director? Well, in the civilian sector, I started with one company and then was asked by, again, General Kernan to come work with them at another company that the General Bono and some other people were running. And I said, okay, let me think about it. And I actually took a pay cut to go work for them. And then, of course, mm -hmm. things changed out for the better, but the, worked with them until 2012. And the company got bought out for a bigger with a bigger company, and things were changing. And so it was the just, contracting game. It was yeah. the contracting game. But it just turned out that let me help you all out. It's time for me to leave, and you all can you know pay, buy me out, do whatever you want to do, and I'll I'll disappear. And that's what we did. So we mutual shifting or just separating. DC contracting for the DoD is a very unique industry. It is, and it's not something that's not meant for the faint of heart. 
<laughs> so to speak. <laughs> so how did you get to um, to where you are today, sir? Well, actually, I my wife ran into General Kickleiter's wife, and she asked what I was doing. And she, my wife, told her nothing, and, and so I get a call from Mick Kickleiter the next day. Come see me. So I went down there to see him, and he said, "Come work for me." So I started where I worked uh, part time for a while as kind of a consultant to travel, speak, and do things like that. And then when General Kickleiter decided to, to retire, it took a couple months, but the Pentagon called me and said, come on over, we want to talk about this. And, you know, they told me they wanted me to come work for them. I said, well, I didn't really want to work full time, but <laughs> I, so five years later, here I am retiring again. So, but it's been, it's been great work. And it's, it's, you know, the things we do for veterans makes this job fairly easy. Now I get the chance to deal with all the headaches of the organization we you know the money parts and the people part and so forth and the hiring and and, and moving pe people move on replacing them and so forth but the actual work that we do for the veterans is just um, so valuable and so it's just the right thing to do so my people enjoy what they're doing absolutely sir it's amazing how wives play a part in our careers decisions just real quick my wife told me i had an interview with the ba on monday <laughs> That's how I got the job here. <laughs> so I, I just keep reminding my wife that doing nothing is actually something. <laughs> so I'm always doing something. It's just I may not be doing it right now, but I'm always doing something. Forward thinker, so, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. How did the commemoration start and what's it, what's its main purpose? Well, the commemoration began with planning in around 2008. And then kicked off in 2012 by President Obama down at the wall on Memorial Day. And just like uh, for World War II in Korea, the country decided it needed to commemorate service during this time period. And the, the focus itself for us is, is relatively simple. We got five objectives that Congress gave us. And really the first one, which is talking about finding and recognizing those who served and their families at that time is the one that keeps us the most busy. And it boils down to basically our entire focus on, on service to the nation. Yeah. So we don't get into business of refighting the war. We don't talk about the political aspects of the war. We don't talk about the rightness or wrongness or who won or who lost. We talk about service to the nation. When asked, did they serve? How did they serve? What did they do? And that's what we stay focused on. So we've actually uh, had very little pushback from even some of the peace organizations at the time because we tell them we're not into commemorating the war. Yeah. We're into commemorating service to the nation. Commemorating the service members that, that – right. That took part. And we picked, because the things we do, we, we were somewhat capable of picking the time frame. We picked 1 November 1955 to 15 May 75. And those dates are meaningful. And for the audience, 1 November was the date, the earliest date we could find of the setting up of a headquarters totally dedicated to Vietnam. And it was the direction to change the military uh, advisory and assistance group, Indochina, to becoming Vietnam. So we started with that Roger. and said that's the first date. And then the second date, the end date, was the war actually terminated end of April 75, when the last elements of the U.S. came out of Vietnam. But because of the Mayaguez event that took place early May, and there were some people killed on that event, and they were authorized to be put on the wall. Their names are on the wall. We elected to just slip it to 15 May so we didn't create a conundrum here no. that, that might have arose. And, and no, everybody understands. And so we're recognizing all who served during that time period, regardless of where they served, because the average soldier, sailor, airman, Marine didn't get the choice of where they were going to serve. They went. You never do. Government. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we basically recognize all who served during that time. And uh, while we understand that some served in a combat zone and there's a there's a difference, but all raised their arms and, and, and took an oath and accepted the challenge and accepted the risk. And so they all deserve to be recognized. Absolutely, sir. One hundred percent. So this is pretty much a, a congressional almost commission 
executed through the DOD if, if we're to- It is. It was authorized by Congress and it's to be executed by the Department of Defense. And so we work, uh, while we work for the secretary, as everybody does, there's a couple layers between us. Roger that. Obviously. Roger that. How are you executing that directive? Uh, in what ways are you executing this, this purpose? How are you reaching out and getting it done? Well, first of all, we got the five objectives, and so we stay focused on those. And in fact, if, my, if you asked one of my people, I hope what they would tell you is we have a singular focus, and that is the veteran. It's the veteran, it's the veteran, it's the veteran. And, and the reason for that is it, it keeps you focused and families are connected. So you roll them in and the other organizations that supported them during Vietnam, other government agencies and so forth are, are there, the allies and so forth. So it all is connected. Yeah. But again, if we stay focused on the veteran, we can't go too far along. But with the, the original plan was to basically build this thing in a hometown centric program and get America to thank its veterans. And so uh, we reached out to ask organizations across the country to join us as commemorative partners. And to date, we, we've had as many as 11,800. Oh my gosh. Now, some have come and gone, some are still with us, and some do better than others. The reason I throw that total number out is because it gives you a frame of reference of of commitment across the country of those who have signed up to help us do what we're asking them to do, which is to find your veterans, recognize them for service for those who served during that time, and to make some degree of, of correction to the way they were treated when they came home 50 years ago. How can you be a commemorative partner? Is it Are these private organizations, are these VSOs, are these city governments? I know the VA is a partner how and who can can become a commemorative partner to what you're doing well you can you you can become a partner any organization across the country if you're a bona fide organization meaning you've got some kind of charter you have the tax code whatever it may be you can become a commemorative partner you have to then agree to support the effort by either conducting events or supporting others who do events or some kind of activity that would be, be beneficial to us in a way of you know sharing the message, getting the word out, and so forth. And the easiest way to become a partner is just visit our website, which is uh, Vietnam War 50th, that's 50th.com. And there's a section, a place there you can go to find out how to become a partner and sign up. The process isn't hard. We just ask for three points of contact so we can reach you. We ask for no funding. In fact, all the wow. work that, that is done, that, that all the materials that we provide to partners in the, in the support of conducting events where they would reach and thank these veterans is done for free. We, we, we're budgeted by DOD and we ship the stuff to them directly Wow! and they get to use that stuff for free. But becoming a partner is fairly easy. You just have to commit to you know participate with us and work with us. And again, stay focused on the veteran and find ways to, to find them and thank them and support them out there in the field. That's awesome. What are some of these, you talked about commemorative partner events. What are some of these events look like? What are, well, they, they range from small to large. The smallest is a single individual, someone finding a veteran and thanking them and presenting them with a pin, shaking their hand and welcoming them home. That's as small as you can get one person. Uh, I've been to events where you have thousands who show up over a period of days. Events that have traveling walls that participate will get visitors over days, over a week, and you will walk away having touched over thousands of people. Uh, so it's, it, it depends on the organization how they want to do it. The only thing we ask is that the events be done with a degree of uh, recognition that this has to be a solemn event, has to be dignified, and it has to be done in a way to offer the nation's gratitude to these veterans who did not get it when they came home. I, I completely agree with that, Sammy. You said it before. And, and I've talked to a lot of Vietnam veterans on this show. And if you go through the archives, you can, you can check it out if you're listening to this right now. But I always look at my service in Iraq and Afghanistan and how we were treated when we came home, the pendulum swung 180 degrees. And I think it was because, and I think if anybody, anybody in Vietnam is listening to this, because of how Vietnam veterans were treated. 
Yeah, I think one, one of the things we find as we travel around is one of the most <clears throat> aggressive groups that are out there trying to make sure the vets coming home today are properly treated are the Vietnam veterans. And when you talk to them, and they'll be very upfront with you, yeah. what happened to them will never happen again. And they're, they've took took it on as a, as, a, as a chore, and they're doing it. And so I, they're helping out. I almost see it as a, as a cross that they bear, they bore for us. Right. You know, and I, and I can't, I can't thank them enough. The neat thing that, the neat thing we see as we travel around the country is that attitude that, that, that it's, it completely shifted. The American people understand that what was done to these veterans was, was wrong and needed to be fixed. And so they're looking for the opportunity. And so in many ways, what we provide them is the opportunity. Is that opportunity. Yeah. And, and we, we give them the, the, the kind of the uh, a little bit of emphasis to, to make that happen and then support them in the process. And more times than not, we are thanked for allowing them to do this as opposed to us thanking them for what they do. And so in, in all honesty, our chore when we travel now is not so much to thank veterans we're there to thank those who are thanking veterans Roger. and trying to encourage more activity. And uh, it's great to watch these veterans being thanked by those people who live with them and in, in their communities because they stay there all the time. We, we travel home, we come back, but those people stay there. And so they'll see them day to day as they move around their communities. Absolutely, sir. Now, now you're the organization that does the pins. Correct. Correct. So for, for those that, that, Correct. that don't know, you find a Vietnam veteran, you pin them. Let me tell you, I, you know, we were given pins to give out because we were commander partners and, and, and our outreach team gave us pins. Probably one of the most emotional things that I've ever done in my post-military service life was pin a Vietnam veteran. To me, it, it looks very small and very insignificant to me. But when I put it in his hand, I can tell that it meant the world to him. The pin is small. But the country's gratitude that is attached to that is, is what's big. And you will find veterans that have a wide range of emotions. Some will be very stoic and will accept it and move on. Others get visibly, emotionally involved, and you can see the value of it. I think from my perspective, I think what we see when this happens is a recognition that the time spent in uniform for that veteran, be it two years as a draftee or 30 years as a retiree, they, they view that time as a portion of it was lost because it, the country wasn't behind them. And when you thank them for what they did and you share that moment with them, what you see is recognition that their time in uniform was of value to this country. And, and therefore, they need to understand that nothing was wasted. It was time well spent, and they feel good about that. I, I didn't think I'd see it, but I saw it right in his eyes when I did that. Sure. Absolutely. It's not hard to see. It happens, and it yeah. happens all the time when you give them these things, and some more so than others. Again, people are different, but a lot of them, Vietnam and service during that time may have been – the major seminal point in their life. Which and, is the same for many of us veterans. Right. Yeah. And so recalling that in a positive light, as opposed to the way they left it when they came home as somewhat negative, means a lot to them. I love that. I absolutely love what, 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 what that the symbolism behind that pin means. Now you got the big 50th anniversary coming up here in Arlington, right? Correct? Or on the wall. What's planned? What do you guys got planned? What's going on? Well, the, because the war had no official start date, we're in the 50th anniversary period, as we call it, Roger. which goes across the gambit of the war. And so if you subtract 50 years from now, you're, you're back to uh, 1970. And the war was still going on at that time. And so we, we've just gone through Tet 68 here a couple of years ago, and we, we had a lot of discussions about those kinds of things. But, but we chose not to focus on that because, again, we're not focused on the war. We're focused on service. 
But as we close up into uh, 2023, we're planning to do a big event here in Washington, D.C., where we can kind of gather the forces, so to speak, and see if we can bring something to bear here in the nation's capital and hope that some of the leadership will attend and participate with it. So we're in the planning phases right now, and and what I've done is kicked it off with the intent of, of having set aside the money so we can help pay for it and so forth. But yeah, plans still in place. We're starting to build them and, and make them go, but it should be a nice time. Roger that. How many partners signed up? Well, the partners are all signed up. They, they signed up oh, uh, wow. to begin with, so, so they'll be there. The, the problem is how we'll get them and which ones. But we've got, uh, again, we've got some very, very interesting partners here in, in town that will certainly participate. We'll expect the VA will be there. Absolutely. We've got an organization, the Daughters of American Revolution, who have been involved with this from the very beginning. And they have thousands of organizations across the country, their chapters that have signed up with us. And they I have, have not reached. heard about the DAR since I was in sixth grade. Well, I was one of their DAR recipients. Wonderful organization. Yeah. In fact, I just met with the new president general here just a week and a half ago, and they've recommitted uh, their efforts to help us out. So the un- other interesting fact is we've got all 50 states, the governors have all signed up. Uh, all six territories. And we've gotten not only the governors, we have the state VA directors and we have their adjutant generals have agreed to help us too. So That's great. across the country, we reach out and touch them periodically, especially around 29 March, which is our special day that President Trump signed into law, which is National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And so that is a big day for us. And we'll let, we lay wreaths at the wall every year and we're hoping to get some senior leadership to help us do that this year. You know, doing social media for the VA, I can tell you that is probably the third most popular day on our social media channels, on all of them. You have, of course, you have Vietnam, or of course, you have Memorial Day and Veterans Day, but the Vietnam Recognition Day? What's the it's, problem? Yeah, it's a recognition yeah. day. It's not a holiday. It's, no. it's meant to recognize yeah. service. But that day is easily the third most popular thing yeah. uh, when we get activity. And you're talking about the state VAs, territories. You also got a lot of expats. In different countries. A lot of Vietnam veterans that were, are now expats, they live overseas. Uh, have you been able to reach that population as well? Uh, not quite as well as in within the country itself here, but, but we do have some. I mean, we, we've touched organizations out in the Far East. We've touched organizations in Europe. And periodically, you know, they'll, they'll pop up and we'll support them. The military exchange system and the military commissary system is on board. And of course, they have stores and, and facilities across the country and they participate with us, especially around 29 March. And so they'll help us do that too. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, the one in the big, the big one coming up in, in Arlington isn't the only event, uh, I'm sure. I suspect, I, I can pretty much tell you here, because we've set a pattern across the years here, that every state in the union and the six territories will do something around 29 March. Now, it's plus or minus a couple of days, depending on schedules. This year, it falls on a Sunday. So some people will, will do it on a, on a weekday when they can get more of a crowd. Sure. But we expect to have to support all states, all territories, and we've got a program to ship materials beginning here real soon. You guys have a running tally of how many events you guys have done? Has the commemoration done or been a partner with? We again, we don't do this the events. We support them and we, we facilitate the partners. We we have supported over eighteen thousand events across the country That's so far. Amazing. That's a lot. That's wow. Outstanding. The, the only the only problem associated with that is right now is that out of the number of vets who served during that time period who are still alive, which is somewhere above 6 million, plus or minus a few, we're losing them at a rate in excess of 500 a day. Yeah. And so rough math, if you do that, you're roughly 200,000 a year you're going to lose. Yes, sir. And so my message to my people and, and as we travel is to remind folks that it'd be a terrible travesty to have a veteran pass away never having received the gratitude of their nation for what they did. And so we're trying very hard to to reach those people. We've got a program in place right now where we're trying to inform and elicit support to reach the veterans that are hard to find, those who can't come to an event, who are either in a VA hospital, a clinic, uh, a center, or in hospice care, or just at home. People know where they are. 
But veterans know veterans. In fact, one of the things I ask veterans when I'm when I speak to an audience is I I tell them every veteran here today knows veterans who are not here. Help us find those veterans. Help them to encourage them to come to events because that's the way we'll meet them. We'll, we'll reach them, encourage them, make them come to these events so we get the we allow the country the opportunity to share the gratitude for what they did years ago, which has been lost to these people years ago. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we can recapture it. When does this end? Is there a time limit on this commemoration? Well, how, how do you know when the mission is complete? Yeah, technically, we go by presidential proclamation to Veterans Day 2025. Roger. And I would imagine our funding will probably f run out somewhere around the end of that fiscal year, just uh, September beforehand. So we suspect uh, that will probably be the last time. Now, the key thing to remember, though, is while the commemoration may go away, it's the country should never stop thanking their veterans. Absolutely. And so that should continue forever. And I'm sure it will. But we, we judge our success based upon the numbers of veterans we run into and we, we, we contribute to connecting with. So we're about 2.6 million now today that we can substantiate that we've got some reasonably good hard data that we've connected with. There may be more, but uh, hard data about 2.6. And so by the time we end that, the, the gross number of, of veterans still living who served in that time will be in the 5 million range. So we're looking to try and tack on another million or so with that 2.6. And then understanding that there'll be some that we just never get for whatever reason. There is There are veterans there that were told when they came home to go away and just, we don't want to know what you did. Go away. Yeah. They're, they're doing exactly what the country asked them to do at that time. We're trying to find them and ask them to come back out and give the country the opportunity and make amends. That's great. Now, sir, you joined active duty relatively late or towards the end of Vietnam. You're now the director of this commemoration. What's it mean to you? You know, you've had a lot of mentors that that came through the war. What's it mean to you to, to be able to have the ability to somehow give back to that generation? Well, I, I think it's the same thing all our partners feel. There's a, there's a tremendous void here in many of these people's lives that they never got the pat on the back that they deserved and they and they earned i mean they don't, they this isn't something given to them free they earned this based on what they did absolutely and the country owes it to them and so being able to facilitate that happening is is a fairly it's very worthwhile and it makes you feel good when i get to travel and get to meet the veterans and stand there and present pins or participate with whatever dignitary might be there presenting pins i get a chance to look in their eyes and it's a very rare veteran who doesn't care about yeah. that and we have run into a few who are disgruntled and that's okay that's, that's part of life but the vast majority are, are are very appreciative of the work that's being done. And of course, you know, they thank us a lot. And, and my retort is always, no, you all earned this. This is not something we deserve thanks for. This is was owed to you years ago. We're just a little late getting it done. But they all take it in stride. Most of them, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of them are, are right on board and they say, thanks for what we're doing. And so that goes a long way and it makes us just try to renew our efforts every day and do a little bit more. Very good, sir. Sir, is there anything that you learned in service that you apply to what you do today? Well, I, I, I'm not sure you could boil it down to one single thing. Sure. It's, it's again, it's, if you don't take care of your people, you're never going to get your mission done. And if you understand that the two things that drive us or is beaten in our heads as we were young, young people coming in the military, is you got to accomplish your mission and take care of your people. Well, you can't do one of those and not do the other. And so they both go together. And so taking care of people is an inherent responsibility of the military. We need the military. We're going to need it in years to come. 
The world is not going to turn over a leaf and become a peaceful place everywhere. And the U.S. military will be asked to perform again someplace else. And in fact, one of my some of, sometimes I open up with reminding people that no generation of Americans has not had the opportunity to serve their country in time of war. Every generation has been confronted with that, and that will probably continue. And in order to have those Americans who are willing to stand up and do that, you have to take care of those who have done it before. Yes, sir. And they need to understand they're not going to be left behind. And so we're kind of cleaning up the battlefield here uh, 50 years afterwards, and we're making amends. And I think it's a, it's a noteworthy thing. It's a good thing to do. The country feels good about it, at least from my perspective, the people I talk to out in, in flyover country USA and in, in, in small towns and everywhere else we go, they want to do this. And so that's what, what I walk away with, that if you're going to, if you want a military, you better take care of it and you better take care of those who served before because those who are currently serving or thinking about serving aren't going to join an organization that turns its back on it on, the, on its people. Look, we're going to help you recruit. If you take care of a Vietnam veteran, guess what? That Vietnam veteran is granddad today. Yes, sir. And who are the most influential of the young to join the military? It's probably grandparents and parents. So by taking care of the grandparents and the parents, we're ensuring that the next generation of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine, Coast Guardsmen that, that come into the, our, our, our line of work will be there. So if I'm going to boil that down, sir, uh, the one thing you learned in service, one thing that one thing that you learned in service was take care of your people. You're just doing it at a very much larger scale. <laughs> yeah, we, we, got, we got a lot of people to take care of, but it's fun doing it. And uh, what's really neat is, is watching them react to what we're doing. The positive nature of the Vietnam veteran not being bitter, but but accepting the fact that the country was just a little late. Yeah. But they're they're yeah. willing to accept now, and they're moving on. And what's really neat is walking around airports and seeing more ball caps, jackets, and shirts that say "I'm a Vietnam veteran." Years ago, in fact, I had a conversation with a Vietnam veteran at, at an event up in Connecticut, and I asked him, "Did you wear that cap ten years ago?" And he said, "No." But he's wearing it today, and he's proud of it. He's proud of his service, and that is what's worthwhile. Sir, is there, and I know you have over 11,000 partners, is there a veteran in the veteran community or a nonprofit that you see as a good example for others to emulate? First of all, the VA. The VA has done yeoman's work with us and, and supported us and, and help us connect to veterans. And so I encourage all the veterans to get to know your VA at the community level, the, the county, state level, and, and be involved. Uh, they need to hear from you, not only when bad things happen, but also good things. We've got the DAR who is right here in town with us, who have been with us very early on. And these ladies are just tremendous in what they do for us. They have such a service-oriented perspective on their, their organization that they thank us when we call them and ask them to meet a single veteran and present a pin. Oh, wow. And so they'll do that for us, and they'll participate at events whenever they're asked. Congress has come on board. They gave us the mission. They authorized it. They gave us the objectives. We have well over 130 congressional offices that have signed up to be partners. And so these members are out there doing that too. We go to events with them and they do a great job. It's a nonpartisan event. It's done totally with focus on service and thanking the veterans. And it, it's a wonderful job. In fact, Very good. I'll give you a story. I went to one up in, in, in Frederick, Maryland. There was a family there at one of the events who's, they lost their son. The mother and sister was there. The message got to me that they never received the Purple Heart that killed that young man. And so I came back home, made one phone call to the, to the Pentagon. Fortunately, got a hold of the right person who said, let me work it, I'll get back to you. Within a couple of weeks, I had a new medal and new set of orders cut. 
I called back up to Maryland. The county commissioner up there set up a special event at the courthouse. I delivered the medal. They presented it on behalf of the United States Army to this family. Wow. And it was just, it's just such a neat thing to do and be able to do just because we, we can make those things happen. The, the last group I would, I would tell people to think about are all the veteran service organizations. They're, they're all there and they're all involved and they're all participating. Many of their groups do, do this work for us. And they need help. They need to renew their membership. They need the young veterans to join and be part of it so they can help us recognize the old veterans. And, um, and that's happening. But I guess that would be a plug if you're thinking about it. Get back involved. Get into the community and be part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem. Roger that, sir. General Jackson, is there anything else that I may have missed? <laughs> <laughs> or I haven't thought of that that you think is important to share uh, for those listening. Well, I guess uh, the last thing I would mention is if, if you're interested, go to our website. Again, I'll give it to you. It's VietnamWar50th.com. Uh, take a look. It's, a, it's actually a new website. It's taken us a while to get it done, but we're pretty proud of it. Go see it. Take a look at it. Get involved in your local area. If you go to our website, you can actually take a look. We've got a map that will show you events that are going to happen in your area. Find out. If you're talking to your VSOs in your local area, they probably know which events are going on. Go to one of the events. Be part of the crowd that gets a chance to thank these veterans and shake their hands and, and, and let them know that what they did was appreciated and uh, their time and service was valuable to the nation. We served our country like those before us. You know, it was a dangerous era. All of Vietnam was dangerous. The carnage of war left an indelible mark on me. We came back and built lives. As time went on, we faced new challenges and found support to handle them. I went to the VA, talked to my doctor. I started doing groups. I started doing one-on-one -on -one counseling. At maketheconnection.net, you can hear our stories and find tools and services available to you. I want to thank the good Major General for his time to sit down with us. For more information on the 50th War Commemoration, visit www.vietnamwar50th.com. They have an events tab, and you can see everything that is planned on or around the March 28th and 29th. I searched in and around D.C., and in addition to the wall, there are all kinds of stuff planned. Our Born the Battle Veteran of the Week comes by way of our Veteran of the Day campaign. Every day, our Veteran of the Day program honors a veteran on our social media channels by telling that veteran's story. If you haven't seen it, check them out. They post every day around noon. This week's Born in the Battle Veteran of the Week is Army veteran James Matthews. James Matthews was born in 1949 along the eastern shore of Nassauwadox, Virginia. I hope I said that right. He and his three siblings grew up in a military family. His father and three of his uncles all served, each in different capacities. After graduating high school and looking for a change, Matthews joined the Army. Matthews went to basic training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for eight weeks, and then completed his eight-week advanced infantry training at Fort Polk, Louisiana. James said, at the time, Fort Polk was considered the training ground for Vietnam. They called it Little Vietnam, or Tigerland. Anybody that went there you knew you were going to Vietnam. While at Fort Polk, Matthews volunteered to go airborne, not knowing what it, not knowing what it all entailed. After training, he headed to base camp. I'm just going to spell it P-H-U-O-C-V-I-N-H, Vietnam, where he patrolled and went on search and destroy missions. Matthews was shot several times in the jungle. He sustained injuries to the stomach, hips, arm, and hand. He traveled stateside to recover, which ultimately took him two years. Matthews received two Purple Heart medals during his time in Vietnam. Though he lost the use of his left leg, Matthews persevered and went on to study electronics in New York City. Soon thereafter, he became an apprentice for a NASA engineering program in Wallops Island, Virginia. James, 
Thank you for your service. That's it for this week's episode of Born the Battle. If you yourself would like to nominate a Born the Battle Veteran of the Week, you can. Just email us at podcast at va.gov, include a short write-up, and let us know why you'd like to see him or her as the Born the Battle Veteran of the Week. For more stories on veterans and veteran benefits, check out our website, blogs.va.gov, and follow the VA on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, RallyPoint, DEPT Vet Affairs, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, no matter the social media, you can always find us with that blue check mark. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you right here next week. Take care. On one of my trips, uh, I was down at Fort Benning meeting with a reunion group from a battalion that was formed at Benning, went to Vietnam. Yes, sir. And there were five families there that were represented, and they were all siblings, so it's brothers and sisters. And we were making the first pres- – it was the first presentation I made of pins that we give to family members, specifically in this case of those – the immediate family of members who uh, are on the wall here in D.C., and so I'm talking to him, and I'm, I'm, I decided I would talk a little bit about the veteran who died and their name, rank, what the unit they were in, and some of the circumstances and when they died. And I kind of went into it thinking, well, it's been 50 years. This, this is, you know, wounds heal and so forth. But I looked over at some of the families, and I noticed they were, to a person, they were tearing up and they were getting emotional. Well, I finished my presentation, and we, we gave it to them. They all thanked us and everything. And I started thinking about it, and what dawned on me was when you look at a family and they talk about Bobby, Jimmy, you know, Fred, or whoever it is who passed away back then, that's when their clock stopped. They think of their loved ones as they saw them last. That was yesterday. In their heads, it was just a day ago when they left and they went overseas. And so that had a significant impact on me. And so I I approach it a little differently now. And I I, I make sure I'm very much uh, aware of what it means to families. We present pins to the families of the missing in action who are still waiting for accountability. And when you present this pin to someone who lost a father or a brother and you ask them, you know, what they were like when they said goodbye. You watch them, you know, get emotionally involved because, again, it was yesterday for them. They remember, you know, Johnny never grew up. Johnny is still that 18, 19, 20-year-old brother who left. They never aged a day beyond that for them. And that is really important. We've been able to connect to 444 of the former POWs and present them with pins and certificates. And that's probably the majority of those that came home of the 600 plus that came home uh, that are still able to get out and we were able to connect with. And we work through the POW organizations to do that. So it's important to recognize not only the veteran, but also the families. And we've got a program for that. And we provide all these materials free of charge. Partners, our partners can request those for free. We send them to them. We get the certificates signed and present, and they can present them. And you, by virtue of the certificates, you personalize the small pin that we give you. And it's just a small pin. It can be worn or it can go in a shadow box. And it, it's important. In fact, I got one lady up in the Pentagon who reminds me that she wears her father's pin that we gave him. And you know, she's not a veteran, but it's her pin now, and she wears it to honor her father, and she shows it to me every time I go up there.